who would like this we couldn't do. Um, tonight, Becca from Skittles is going to be moderating, so um, you should be in for a treat. And I'm going to hand it over to Becca. Hello, everybody. I'm sure you're well aware what this panel is about already, but just to recap, we'll be talking about mental health and music. So we'll be talking about how working in the industry can have a negative effect on your mental health, but also how music can really help you if you are struggling. Um, so I think to start off, if we all introduce ourselves, as Alice said, I'm Becca. Um, guys, if you could give a little bit of background on where you're from, but also why you've been asked to come to this panel specifically. Oh, you've got your own, sorry. Right, I'm going to keep hold of this one. <laughs> How you doing, guys? Um, yeah, my name's Liam O'Reilly, um, and I uh, run a company called Pipe for the People, which is a non-profit ticketing platform, competitor of Skittle, um, and also a <laughs> venue... <laughs> Uh, a venue in Sheffield called the Night Kitchen Warehouse Club, um, and <coughs> work with some record labels and kind of manage some DJs and stuff like that. Um, yeah, been working in the industry kind of the last, well, I guess, six years, um, but was working full time before that. Quit my job to do music and be happy because uh, I hated my old job. Um, but over the last couple of years of the strain of working so hard in the events world, I guess, has taken its toll on my on my brain a little bit, um, and also probably. My behaviour probably had its impact on that as well. I had a bit of a tough year this last year, but kind of after this summer, I managed to kind of pull it back again and kind of wanted to come, I guess, chat rubbish about it. Hi, everyone. I'm Christine Bryan. I'm Director of External Affairs at a charity called Help Musicians UK. Uh, Help Musicians um, has been actually around since 1921 and was under the name of Musicians Benevolent Fund. Uh, we're the biggest health and welfare um, provider give out about two million a year to to when I say musicians I'm talking the whole industry so from producers to tech to to crew um, and the reason why I'm here tonight is because since May last year we um, well we launched a, a study which was looking into mental health in the industry but really it's about what we can do um, and later in the year, we'll be launching a service which is specifically around mental health for people in the industry, um, which I'll talk more about. So it's something that's really close to my heart um, and hopefully it'll really change lives. And I think that platforms like this are really important that we start talking about it. Hello, I'm Jack Barton, a uh, resident DJ for Micron. Uh, we've been 11th birthday coming up. 11 years. Nice and, oh, yeah, sorry, I'm going to stop dropping things in. I also run a music studio where I teach, uh, I teach music production to all ages. Uh, I've sort of found myself teaching a lot of um, people who are 40 plus, which is going to be one of the things I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and my take on it all is I've suffered from various different mental issues all my life, and I've always used it as a form of therapy. And a lot of the people who come to me, I find also have some sort of anxiety issues. It's not because I'm promoting to these people or anything like that. It just seems to be the way that people who are into music or creative anyway, I find, tend to have some form of mental issue. And I'll be talking about how music is used as a therapy for these people. Um, I'm Ben Pierce. Uh, I made one song and then kind of rode the coattails. Still doing it now. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I've, I've, I've struggled with some stuff uh, over the last like couple of years and, and trying to help other people to deal with it through um, whichever ways I can like manifest some sort of good advice. from. But I've learned a lot through it about myself and about my friends and about um, life. So hopefully something good will come of what I say. Absolutely. Um, Christine, I wanted to start with you. So obviously, like you say, you deal with all different types of musicians, young, gold, you know, different walks of life. So what would you say are the most common themes and problems that you come across as a charity? Um, well, I guess if we're talking about mental health specifically, um, so we commissioned um, what was the world's first um, study on mental health in the music industry last May. Um, and over 2,000 respondents um, took part in, in it, and I think about 30% were kind of DJs, producers. Um, um, 
the main things that came back, really, I mean, firstly, I should say the stats in terms of people who had suffered from anxiety and depression were around 70%. And if you compare that to the general public, it's basically stating that people who work in music are three times more likely to suffer from anxiety, depression, any type of mental health issue, which is pretty shocking. Um, so I guess the reasons in there, um, what you'd would expect, um, regular working hours, being away from home, um, money, um, sometimes um, trying to, uh, the, the competition, um, the need to succeed, um, yeah, all of those relationships actually. Um, and then I suppose there, there were some things that came out also um, around being a woman in, in working in the music industry. So obviously you're all aware of the news at the moment around sexual harassment. There was a theme around that. So we're looking at all those various aspects and, and hopefully we'll be able to launch something really meaningful at the end of the year to address them. Yeah. And this is open to, to all you guys. Why do you think that artists are so susceptible to mental health problems? I tend to find it's kind of the, an overworking of the mind quite a lot. I find, find a lot of artists tend to be quite intelligent and I think that's, I sort of see that from my own experience and from people I've spoken to is that it's kind of almost like a mental, the, your, your brain's in overdrive all the time. I find like anxiety, people sort of latch onto things and it can drive out of control, especially my sort of, with myself, is like how think about things far too much and I think it's not necessarily sort of I personally don't think it's a being an artist I think it's more to do with the tendency of your brain just to be an overdrive I, that's kind of the way I've seen and also you know I'm allowed to say this but drugs a lot of artists do drugs uh, and that's not I don't think that's kind of a, a cause I think that's the, it, the relationship between that is it the cause or the effects I think a lot of people especially myself, and, you know, would turn to drugs to, as a form of an escapism. And it's a vicious cycle from that, I find. And I, I just tend to find that artists are more susceptible to go down that route. Yeah. And um, Ben, as an artist yourself, do you find that, you know, there's almost preconceptions and, you know, there's an ego thing about being an artist? You know, you're almost looking after your pride do you think that stops yeah, I have people no pride. from <laughs> but um no i think the, yeah, the whole point of being an artist and, and this is in any way um if you're trying to sell a product which is i don't know music or i don't know paintings or whatever you have to be a narcissist really you have to care about what people think of you and you have to care about who's looking and who's buying it and you want everyone to like you and like me um so i think that drives kind of a self-esteem issue because then when when people don't buy it and people, um, for whatever reason, like don't like your picture of a of a cat or whatever you post on social media. Um, they then you start to question yourself. I mean, I was talking about it with Liam before um, how if you put a put a post out, put a record out, even uh, if it doesn't do as well as you'd hoped or you kind of thought it might, um, it starts to make you doubt your work um, more so maybe than you would anyway. Mm -hmm. I think that's a massive part of it. Yeah. And Liam, as somebody that works more behind the scenes, so to speak, how would you say it impacts on your life? Yeah, I think there's kind of, obviously there's been a lot of talk about <coughs> kind of the artist side of things as well, but then the whole industry itself is kind of, you can kind of end up feeling a little bit like an outsider um, because you spend a lot of your time um, as kind of a promoter or kind of an organiser or facilitator. I see my man Carl here, the sound system boys as well. You spend a lot of time facilitating a lot of other people having a lot of fun. Um, and then no matter how much fun that might be while you're working, you are still at work. You can never turn that part of your brain off. Like you are still in the zone. You never fully switched off. A lot of these people are going out for pure escapism. They're going out to like forget about their work in the week. Whereas we're working <coughs> kind of 12 hours of the weekend, making this party as best as you can, like playing the best set, like making the sound the best, making the party as best as you can. And you can't ever actually feel like you're actually fully participating in it. You, you like dip your toe in it, but it can feel a little bit lonely, um, especially as kind of, as maybe you grow up a little bit. I mean, a lot of people get into promote when they're young and they've got lots of friends and they all come to their parties, but as you get a bit older and you realize this is what you love and also what you're good at, um, you become then surround yourself with kind of just industry people um, and that's not a bad thing, but we're all going through the same thing, and it and it's bloody knackering as well. Like the lack of sleep, 
obviously drink and drugs as well obviously have <coughs> their own impacts for different people um but spending that much time kind of looking in on everybody else having fun can get you down a little bit sometimes i think yeah. and we've just um had world mental health day and i've noticed in particular a lot of artists industry people speaking on twitter you know hashtags everybody seemed to be speaking about it a lot more than normal why do you think people are opening up this is to anybody That's a good question. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, not to be controversial about it, but I think like, a couple of years ago it became fashionable for some reason to talk about it, which really upsets me, actually. It's like we put out this study last year. The stats came out in November, and lo and behold, Zane came out and said that he had um, mental health issues and Adele. It was all around the same time. It felt, you know, there was a book coming out or there's an album coming out. So whilst it upsetting, I think it was fashionable at some point. Um, and maybe that continues. I, I, I don't know. But um, now it's good that the industry are starting to talk about it. But for me, um, it's about what's next. It's about what are they what are we actually doing so i don't know i'm really pleased that people feel the need to 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 speak out about it but i mean it's got to be more than retweets um i think maybe a little aspect of that as well is the way that the industry has progressed over the last few years um particularly i mean obviously like on electronic dance music front of point of view obviously mental health in the music industry has been an issue forever but i think the fact that the industry had such a boom over the last kind of 10 years i'd say all of the deep house explosion and things like that um that there's kind of a whole generation of people whose pop music was dance music now and as a result of that a lot more of those people have gone into working in that i think maybe we've hit a crisis point um, with it kind of impacting big artists <coughs> on, on, on levels that where kind of, fortunately they can't do shows because they're not well enough. Like the, the visibility of that is so much higher now. So it's kind of forced a discussion a little bit. Um, and yeah, I mean, le a level of trainability, I'd obviously hope the world is not that cynical, but there is also always that aspect of it. Um, but I just think enough people who are in a position of kind of influence, I'd say, um, have gone through it and it kind of couldn't, couldn't not say anything any longer because you had to get it out. Ben, do you want to? Yeah. Um, yeah, so my, my kind of thing is, is trying to tread the line between um, speaking about it and being positive and helping people uh, and using it to promote yourself. Um, so I'm very much of the opinion if, if uh, an interview, I've turned down a few interviews because I felt that they were going to be asking about that, but also promoting like a new a single or whatever, and I didn't want to use that. I think that might be encouraged, a good way to encourage people just to just try and distinguish those things and not I, I know it's because it's fashionable now they everyone wants to talk about it so you have interviews where you just normal interview and they'll just chuck it in or um to try not to try not to use it as a promotional tool it's a very fine line to kind of tread um and my thing is is also been i, I don't really want to do a sub story and tell everyone about how shitty i felt like yet last year because no one wants to hear that really it's, it's not constructive what's constructive is saying, oh, well, this is how you can get better, and this is what I did to get better. Um, I don't think there's any positives coming out of, um, of just telling people how bad you felt and what happened to you. Um, and everyone has, uh, has their own way of dealing with things, so it's more about just passing all the advice on you know in your head to somebody, and then they can just take it and, and deal with it in whatever, whichever they, they want. I wanted to ask quickly, your you know, story was so high profile, like it was written about in pretty every music publication yeah, at the time. Was that, you know, when you decided to speak about it, was that a really big step? Because you could have not mentioned it at all, I suppose. Um, no, I mean, that, that, that point, again, I'm just contradicting myself on doing the sub story thing. No, but um, uh, I was, I was, um, I, I kind of took the time off because I needed to, uh, and at the time, I was like, I didn't want to speak to anybody, like not even, I don't know, the, the delivery driver. Um, so I wasn't, wasn't leaving the house for like weeks on end. Yeah, yeah all right. Um, and uh, yeah, so I didn't want to speak about it then. But then I think once I started to feel better uh, and make some progress and, and use these kind of tools that people gave me, um, then I wanted to help people through that. And, and reading through all the comments that on the Facebook post that I posted was amazing, receiving all the messages, he hearing other people's positivity um, and 
stories of how they felt down and then they got better. So that, that helped me massively. So I wanted to kind of pass that on to people um, if anyone was kind of struggling themselves. And this isn't just about artists, obviously, it's about people that enjoy dance music and, and go raving. And you mentioned before, Liam, about how drugs can play a big part. So how important do you think it is to like educate young people to not burn out really quickly? A lack of education in drugs is one of the is something that really needs to be rectified. I mean, drug, drug education in school, it's like whitewashing everything with the same brush, tarring everything with the same brush. If you, t if you have a drug on a spliff, you're going to end up homeless, or you're going to end up dead. If you have some heroin, you're going to end up dead. Or you know, and it's like there's no kind of gauge. Drug education should be a look. If you go out and you do a pill, you're going to love everyone. You're going to have a great time, but you're going to feel like this. That's what drug education should be. And I think the lack of that in the UK schools you know, that's why you're seeing kids dying at warehouse projects because they don't have any, they don't know how to take drugs responsibly. And, you know, it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I think that kid, guys, like kids especially, they're going to do drugs. You can't, you know, the war on drugs hasn't worked, you know, not at all. But, you know, I think that in terms of educating the children in terms of, you know, what to expect and how to use drugs safely would probably really help. It's not going to stop them going out and getting on it. Nothing's going to stop that, you know. But I think, yeah, having an education and understanding the, the effects that drugs have on the long-term mental health as well. Again, this, this is something that needs to be implemented into schools, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think education is really, really important. I think making sure it's part of a wider picture, though, because, you know, so the drugs chat is part of wider kind of mental well-being. I think actually education on mental well-being is just... I, I think colleges are getting better at it. You know, there are some colleges that, that are looking at it. I know there's Cato Academy, who are in London, who actually do a lot around production, um, students in production. Um, yeah, I think education is really important, but I think it's like across the whole piece. Yeah, um, I think there's definitely like both elements of that. Drug education is absolutely woeful. Like it's just criminal that the fact that we're just like, we're so far behind in terms of the kind of addressing that. And, but also, yeah, the mental health aspect of the drug chat is that drugs affect everybody differently. Um, some people can go out and get fully kind of loaded and not suffer. Some people could go out and do the smallest amount of drugs and feel like doom for a week afterwards. And the difference is, is like it, knowing those people who do really suffer from it, that those people, they're not, there's nothing wrong with them. There's a lot of, there's, <coughs> particularly with, there's a lot of bravado. I find now with the sesh culture a little bit, I mean, don't get me wrong, I've, all, I've liked the sesh in my time, but the kind of the competitive aspect of it that kind of just turns it, takes it away from kind of how each individual, it's the same with alcohol or anything that makes, it doesn't has an impact on you as a person. Nothing affects anybody the same way and that you need to acknowledge yourself before you kind of try and keep up with everyone else. Can I just say one more thing? Sorry, just about, um, it's education, but it's also knowing where to go. So it's access to information. So education's all well and good, but to be honest, you could say to a drug addict, hey, don't, get dr don't take drugs, it's not very good for you. Well, they're not gonna do it, are they? I mean, or they will do it. Um, so it's about people knowing where to go should they, should they want help. So, yeah. Yeah, I, similar approach. I kind of just, I don't know the, the correlation between drug use and mental health. Um, I don't know if there is one. I don't. I don't know if there's, you've done any yeah. in the process of. Yeah. So um, I. I kind of also feel that, especially with uh, electronic dance music, the, the 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 drug question gets brought into the debate about mental health far too often. Like, no offense, guys. I, it's really important, but it kind of detracts from the main issue because then you're we're talking about drugs then, and like it, it makes no sense to me. To for because I know people that are never taken a drug in their life and they suffer massively with this stuff. So. There's, with, without there being a direct correlation, for me, I don't know how productive it is um, to talk about it to kids. And well, obviously it is on a different level, but not in these kind of discussions, personally. I can speak from personal experience that it rarely affects me, so I've had to knock it on the head. So I do think there is a correlation. I think it depends on the person, but I think it can I've really aggravate it. I think there is a correlation, but to say that the issues aren't already there before drugs, because I, yeah, I was, 
maybe I wasn't aware of it at the time, but when I was, you know, I, I was aware of kind of the anxiety and the depression and all that kind of stuff way before I started doing drugs. And this is kind of what I said before about the, you know, are the drugs a source of an escape? Which definitely for me, they've definitely for me they were, you know. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm guilty of that, definitely. But then, you know, again, some people say, oh, well, you feel depressed because you're doing it, which again sort of reigns true. And I think it is kind of down to the individual person. I think mental health it exists in artists before drugs. I just think it's, it's, it's exaggerated by drug use, is what I tend to have found. Yeah, I'd like to continue on that. I think that's a really valid point um, in terms of kind of how um, drugs affect people and things like that. There is, I mean, I particularly felt in my kind of life, there's, I've shouldered a lot of blame for how I felt at times um, due to the fact of the lifestyle that I have led at points due to kind of drug use and drinking and, and excessive partying and things like that. <coughs> um, and it took me a good time and it took me a bit of like, proper self-reflection and time not doing drugs to realise that I was still feeling like that even when I wasn't doing the drugs, but that um, kind of almost the societal pressure of the fact that a lot of people when, they, when you tell them or kind of indicate that you are not feeling great and they know kind of how kind of the behaviour that you do sometimes have, it's their go-to. And then you kind of then f shut yourself down after that because it's like, all oh, right, this conversation's over. They think, just because I do drugs, that's what's sending me mental. <coughs> Whereas I was just mental before and I was probably doing the uh, escapism aspect of it as well. Um, and that's taken me 28 years to realise that. Like, and that's like, I, I really do struggle, for, like feel sorry for younger people who are kind of, who haven't had that time to reflect on how stuff affects themselves and get to know their own selves, own, know their own minds better. Um, I mean, not to say that drugs make you better, um, but to acknowledge, acknowledge your own self as well. Um, because I'm the impartial person here, <laughs> so just to pick up on what you were saying about the correlation. Yeah, no, 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 no. I think it's, I, I just wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to pick up on it because within the study that we did, um, there wasn't really, um, whilst people said that they used um, alcohol and drugs as a coping mechanism, it didn't come as like a main strand or focus of the research. It was actually more about unpredictable working hours, not earning enough money, feeling isolated because as, as a DJ, like you're on your own, you go back, or whether you're a, a classical soloist, you know, you go back to your hotel room, you're on your own, what do you do? You hit the low. So I don't know. I'm kind of with Ben. Um, whilst I, you know, I don't work in this kind of sphere, I'm, I'm just, from my perspective and from the charity's perspective, it's important for us to see the whole, the whole spectrum and look at how we tackle each one. I wanted to ask you guys a little bit about social media because obviously it plays a huge part in the music industry and you know people have their own personal accounts and do you think as artists or people that work in the industry that the pressure the expectations the comparisons that you make with people on social media could affect people I think that's the case even outside of music I think social media has put so much pressure on especially teenagers it's a it's all about bravado and I think it's uh, it allows you to almost to compare yourself to other people's fake lives and you know bigging up their fake lives so but in, in the music industry it's 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 rife it's you always said ben, ben said before you know you sort of you post something or you release something you've you've got instant feedback and that feedback not, might not be what your ego needs and that's kind of where it gets a bit dangerous i think within the music industry and i've seen it not only with myself but with like lots of friends in the music industry that social media, I've been a lot of my friends now have deleted social media for that. You know, social media, you can wake up in the morning, check Facebook, and it can put you in a shit mood straight away. You know, and I think if so, social media is as good as it is, I think for mental health, I don't think it's great at all. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, fuck Twitter. Um, um, no, uh, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the comparison thing, and, the, and the, the thing about social media, especially um, more and more these days, is that you're you're looking at someone's kind of best shot. Uh, so not to shame, but I was in uh, Bali recently, and there was a couple spending about thirty minutes trying to get the perfect shot of them, each of them at the pool, and they'll only post one. So you're not going to see the one where they've got their eyes closed or where they're sneezing. She wasn't sneezing, but you never know. Um, so you're always looking at the best picture. So you've got to, 
I kind of realized that after a while, but I was looking at, because my industry is DJs, and I was looking at DJs, and they were all doing these amazing things. And I was like, oh, I should be doing that. Why am I doing that? You compare yourself to them constantly, and because you have to, because as I said before, it's a competitive market, and you have to um, try, and, try and get into it. Um, like the guy that developed the like button on Facebook, the actual engineer behind it, doesn't use Facebook anymore. He's deleted all of his social media accounts. But we have an industry, and, and again, I'm speaking from electronic dance music, but a lot of music's the same. Not sure about your classical soloists. Don't know how they are on the Facebook game. But uh, it, you, we have to do it, because all, it's all based on there. We're, we're, we're an industry that pretty much relies on it, apart from, obviously, Skiddle's an incredible website. Uh, but... Um, we we yeah everyone's like lives was on face we built built it up on there and that's how we that's how we market ourselves um, today so it's a very difficult kind of having a relationship with it in a in a business sense and having a relationship with it with, with it personally um, you might have a personal account obviously and have your page but it's uh, it's certainly toxic and I think uh, a, a friend of mine suggested doing one day off a, a week usually Sunday. And just turning, I've tried it, I can't, it's really hard. Because I need to keep checking Twitter to see if World War 3's broke out. Um, but I... I <laughs> did 2017, we're finding out on Twitter. Anyway, um, yeah, so I, can't, I find it hard to switch off. And I know it's a fault of mine, I accepted it as a fault. Um, and I need to get better at it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just um, quite an interesting question for me, actually. Because I actually work as a social media manager for um, a couple of record labels. Um, and a couple of artists as well. Um, I'm not the devil, please don't hate me. Um, kind of actually came over the last year when I've actually been trying to sort my life out and trying to find a niche for me within the kind of musical world that didn't involve promoting and risking loads of money all the time and working until 9am all the time and try and be a bit, I don't want to say grown up, but trying to be a bit more mature about where I'm at with my own head. Um, and yeah, it's, social media is the devil. But the devil is one. We kind of have to accept that now. We never. There isn't going to be some sort of revolution where everybody goes offline. Um, <clears throat> but the power of music will always overpower that, in my opinion. Um, it's just about harnessing those existing platforms that are there. Um, I, I mean, it sounds a bit cliche, but through positivity and not trying to get downtrodden by <clears throat> kind of the comparative assets really hard. I know that everyone has their own personal struggles with that. But if you put what you're proud of and if you put up your music and if you share what you want to share with other people, kind of just kind of out there without kind of craving the feedback, and it can actually be really good kind of positive like marketing tool. This is a business at the end of the day. People are trying to like earn some money and pay some rent. Um, whereas like the traditional kind of Facebook marketing things like that are very competitive. Um, but I've kind of been trying over the last year or so, been really trying to work on, I guess, kind of a positive approach of just putting stuff up that you care about, that matters to you, even if you don't think it's going to matter to anybody else. If it's a picture with you and your cat, it's a picture of you and your dinner. Like, if you care about putting that up enough, that's, like, it making you feel good. So, like, try and... If somebody else resonates with that, then that's great. And then, fingers across, the amount of passion that particularly artists are putting into their music and record labels. People spend a lot, people put a lot of time and a lot of money into putting records out, and for, often for no return. Like, if you put that much effort into something, you should, like, you want to be able to share it with people and trying to give yourself the best platform to let the music speak, I guess. Um, we've been really negative so far, but I thought, Jack, you could turn it around by telling us how music actually helps you when you're feeling down. Yeah, I mean, with myself, like when, again, not trying to do any sort of sub stories, but when you're kind of on a, on a low, for me, my escape, other than doing drugs at a time, you know, but like my escape, my midweek escape would be, uh, yeah, basically locking myself in my room and making music. That's it, you know, and I found that was... No, the, the, I think one of the reasons why I, I, you know, I've picked up instruments in the past. I've tried hobbies, and music production and DJing. I'd like the two things that really stuck with me. And I think because it's always been there for me when I've been in my darkest times. Like you know, when I'm that down, I don't want to talk. I don't like people seeing me. I don't like people to get an idea of when I'm in a you know pretty bad place. I, I tend to maybe this isn't something I should be doing, but I tend to lock myself away and kind of just sort of give myself the therapy, if you like, and it's always been music. Uh, and I found that, you know, a lot of, and it's only since starting my business and teaching people how to produce music, that I became really aware that actually there's a lot of people that I've known for years, you know, around the music scene of Manchester, or even like, you know, as I say before, a lot of the people come to me are kind of over 40, they've got kids, they've got a family, they used to go out, but they don't anymore, but they feel like they're stuck in a rut. 
and they've got that kind of, they feel depressed in that way. You know, they, they love their lives. I'm not saying they don't, you know, they, they want to run away and run away from their kids or anything like that, but I'm saying, you know, they just feel like they've lost their youth kind of thing. And music for them, music production, like the fact they can sit at home on a laptop and basically make beats again. It's like, you know, I've, I've had people personally tell me, it's like, look, I feel like an artist again. I always wanted to be an artist when I was a teenager, 20s, but then kind of got a corporate job and I'm working nine to five and now I feel like you've given me that, you know, and I feel alive again. So music can help. I mean, I mean, music does help. Music far outweighs anything we're talking about now, I think. You know, we wouldn't all be doing it if it wasn't, if it wasn't more positive than it was negative. And that's the, that's the bottom line. I think music is the most powerful healer. You know, and then there's plenty of people saying about that in the past, you know, so, and it's true. And that's something that I've always used. And I found, like, you know, that it's, I've, I found a lot of the people that come to me, they book in for a two hour session and we spend an hour just chatting. It's kind of, you know, it's, I found myself as like, kind of like a mentor for, for this. And it's like, you know, I'd say it was, it's more of just a side effect of running the business. It's just happened to be the fact that people come to me and I'm quite open to people. If people say they're feeling down, I'm quite, you know, I'll, I'll talk about it. And, you know, a lot of these people have found more, lots, so much more benefit than we're kind of, we say you're putting a bit of a negative slant on it, but really the power of music as a healer far outweighs any of the kind of the, anything else personally to me. Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I've got a strange relationship with electronic music now. Um, I've found that it, it's, it's difficult for me to use it in kind of a therapeutic ways because it's, it, uh, without sounding really bleak, it's really difficult to uh, to love something that like has almost killed you, and I find that's a that's a daily struggle for me when I'm when I'm working, and I I kind of had to qualify my electronic music and my studio as work, so I can't use that anymore in in a kind of enjoyable way, which is not in, not like I don't enjoy it when I'm there. When it's going right, it's fine, but when it's going wrong, it's horrible. Um, so I use bands like my my where I came from, where I grew up, it was always bands. So I listen to my I've got a playlist of like favorite my favorite bands from years ago, or even now. Um, so yeah, massively, I, I can use that sometimes before gigs if I'm not feeling great to kind of just put my headphones in, noise cancelling headphones, and just listen to that for a bit. Um, and I think, I don't know, was it William Blake or something that said that the, each artist has to make their own religion? Like, you, there's, no, there's no universal way of telling everyone, like, oh, do this and you'll feel better. Like, you, everyone's got to kind of find the way. It might not be through music. You might like um, playing, I don't know, Dominoes, or um, yeah, something like that. But so, but you've got to find a way of um, of making yourself feel better. But music is so powerful in that way that, uh, that it can speak to you and it can invoke so many emotions. I mean, I don't, it's it's such a powerful thing. And, and there's a lot of studies kind of done into why it, why it connects with us so much, which I've read about, which is super interesting. If anyone likes interested in that kind of brain chemistry stuff, it's really interesting because um, there's really nothing else. If you think about it, it can make you kind of like laugh, cry, all these kind of different emotions. Uh, so yeah, it is, it is, it is awesome, but, um, but yeah, I, I guess it's just using it in the way that, that resonates with you the most. Um, well, yeah, I would, well, I would agree. I mean, our study was called Can Music Make You Sick? But actually what came back, Mine yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it wasn't, uh, what came back is like music doesn't make you sick. Um, it's a great healer for people, and um, but it's the the conditions and um, what's around you sometimes that can make you feel sick. Um, but I just wanted to share with you kind of a, a bit of a strange um, case study that we came across when we were doing this study, which is that, um, and I didn't know this existed, but one of the guys who did um, the second phase of um, in-depth interviews actually had developed in his depressive kind of state a fear of music. So, and one, and one of this really, really, he was on a panel for us and he talked about um, even the sound of the birds, like, made him want to scream. So he, like, he sat in a room for months um, with the windows closed, couldn't, couldn't, he couldn't even play. Um, and then he went to see, well, he, someone in Northern Ireland, they're not going to get it anyway, but said, um, oh, yeah, I have a fear of B-flat. 
And he was like, what? Um, so yeah, anyway, so basically what I'm saying is, yeah, it affects everyone differently. Now, that's why Help Musicians wants to do something specifically for people who work in music, because it's different, because you, you're affected differently, or you talked about your creative brain, and you just want someone who gets it. Yeah, I think the, um, <coughs> kind of following on from that, kind of for everyone, that I think one thing for me, kind of since I was very young, um, <coughs> Music has always hit me on a very like deep emotional level, both positive and high. Um, so you get like when you listen to your emo when you're like 12, it was just like make you really sad. Um, which was like kind of I grew up on like punk and hardcore. That was kind of a big part of the anger when I was a teenager. Kind of cliche angst. Um, and then electronic music, kind of that joy you found on the dance floor. Um, when I was kind of going through a really negative patch with music, kind of like I guess last year, kind of just a year before last. Mostly to do with work, mostly to do with money, mostly to do with promoting um, and booking acts that you really love, like really, really love, and you want to share them with other people, and then people don't come, you lose loads of money, and you think that nobody cares, and it just makes you really sad, because you, like, you really like these people, and you think, oh, it's kind of what's the point? Like, nearly quit promoting, nearly quit the music industry, and then I went um, the night after, I'd lost loads of money, um, went on a Sunday to Bristol, with kind of my friends to watch Laurent Garnier for the first time, like one of my idols that I'd never seen DJ before, on a Sunday in the afternoon, I like changed my life, like pulled me back from the brink, like just completely reminded me as to why I got into this to begin with, that those kind of six hours on a dance floor in a club with not that many people there either, way not enough people from the promoter, so I felt sorry for them. Um, but just like pulled me back and then I met, like, had a chat with my mouse who was the nicest guy and just to see that level of enthusiasm for music at somebody who's kind of 50 years old like literally actually like made me not stop basically and kind of that really I've kind of tried to hold on to that um, for that like one day of positivity for music pulling back all those really negative months that like music does still have that power and, like just to try and kind of frame that in my head. And for anybody that's really struggling what would you say are like the first steps that are good to take for somebody that's really unsure, they're in a really terrible place? It's baby steps, isn't it? So what are them first baby steps? Um, I've, I've done this with a few people recently and I'm obviously not qualified in any way to talk about it, but I feel like through kind of process of what I've been through, uh, I just kind of share what I thought was, was important. And I think acceptance is a huge thing. Just, just write it down. Say, I am depressed on a piece of paper or, or tell yourself daily. Um, and then another thing for me is something I read recently or heard recently um, is that like evolution-wise, we, we are humans are de uh, like designed to deal with trauma. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be here. So saying about the, the, if you were a caveman and, and like s your wife or whatever gets taken away by a saber-toothed tiger, you're going to feel like, depressed, but if you wallowed in self-pity and didn't go out and get food, you would die. So look, evolution-wise, we are designed to deal with it. We've got the facilities there, it just takes time. And I think this kind of, um, this modern world where we're all kind of self-sufficient and we can hide away, we're not, so if you were part of a group uh, back in those days when we are evolved to deal with that kind of stuff, um, you would were, you were need it every day, You'd like, but you can kind of retract into your own little shell. and. So go out and speak to people, find your friends, um, and, and just say, I need help, I need to talk. I don't even need help, I just want to I just want to hang out. Find the people that you uh, have fun with. So I've got these, I've got a, a lot of friends that I don't see for like years, or like a year, but then every time I see them, was like, just go and find them, go, go out your way, even just talk to them. We've got phones, we've got Skype, we've got Facebook, everything, just connect with them. Uh, I think that would be the first thing. And then the second thing would just be kind of, just go and get help, for professional help. Uh, call, I don't know, there's amazing charities, uh, Samaritans and, and, uh, and so forth that you can ring. Um, get some help from someone that can, that can kind of analyze what you're feeling. Um, but accepting it is a huge thing. And I think once you kind of do accept it, you can kind of see it as, uh, as, as, a, th as a kind of thing that's in your life and it's a part of you. Uh, and you can deal with it a lot better emotionally and, and, and mentally, I find. Um, and kind of just know that, oh, this is a bad day, but a good day is only like one sleep away, if you know, so that's some things I would say. Yeah, I agree, uh, sort of admitting it to yourself is kind of a massive thing. Because like at first, when I, you know, I, I said, I was 
for me, it wasn't until I was about 21 when I actually kind of went to a counsellor. So I got referred for uni and that's, I sort of, they sort of told me, it's like, oh, this is what's going on. And once you kind of are aware of it and you admit it to yourself, like Ben said, then you can start dealing with it, you know? Uh, and for me, I used to write poetry about it. That's kind of what I kind of did. I sort of like tried to sort of, these feelings that I kind of knew were going inside, but I couldn't really explain them. I tried to, that, that was my outlet and that's how I came to understand the condition that I had. And again, you know, talking about it, I mean, I didn't speak about, I didn't speak about it until about two years ago, and this is something I've had since I was about 13, you know, and it, was, it wasn't until I started speaking about it how many people actually are there to listen. Like, I had my first nervous sort of breakdown, my anxiety attack, uh, the first one in years, about three weeks ago, and I just put a thing on Facebook, again, because it was like something I didn't want to sort of keep inside anymore, and I thought I'd sort of say, you know, this is something that I do deal with. And the amount of support that I got, the amount of text messages that I got off people who, you know, I didn't even think would care. But the amount of people who do care, and I think more now. And, I've, you know, again, you said about the popularity thing, but, you know, fair enough, some people will be jumping on this bandwagon. It's something that I picked up on be before. But there is a positive side effect of that, is that more and more people are, you know, even if they don't suffer it themselves, they are there to help. And that's one thing I've found. Yeah, no, I think that's fair, actually, because... Whilst I'm talking from an industry perspective about, um, you know, what what are we doing about this, um, I did notice so much more activity on social media than other years in terms of mental or um, World Mental Health Day. Um, I wasn't really here to speak about my own personal experience, but I think, I don't know, I feel compelled to do so. <laughs> um, because I, yeah, I'm... Uh, I agree. I think the, the hashtag that's out, which is it's okay not to be okay, is really, really important. And that's part of acceptance. It's like just sitting there thinking, okay, I feel like shit right now, but actually it's okay to feel like shit. And then kind of if you can talk to someone about it. Um, I mean, I'm coming from the industry perspective, whereas it's my job to like help anyone as in to facilitate and help anyone that works in the industry, and I'm leading the mental health campaign. However, I have just returned from work after taking eight weeks off because I just stepped back and said, I can't do it anymore. I've had long-standing issues. It got too much. Step back. Now, that's also what I'm saying is, whilst we're talking about the different parts of the industry as individuals, it's also the industry to look inward at their own structures. So labels, so wh whether that's independent majors, even help musicians as a charity, we're leading a mental health campaign, but I was, you know, now we're looking at what do we do for staff? So, you know, it affects, it can affect everyone, but yeah, it's okay. And I, and I said on Facebook when I got back to work and everyone went, what? As if you have mental health problems. And I'm like, yeah, you, you just don't see it sometimes. So ask people if they're okay as well. Yeah, what, <laughs> kind of was going to start on that point as well myself. Obviously, the thing, the key thing for me was communication, particularly with uh, loved ones, people that are close to me. Um, but one of the things that was really getting to me and was probably having one of the biggest negative effects was the pressure of work <coughs> and how much work we tend to do in the music industry. We all work way too hard and way too long because we love it at the, at the kind of core of it. Um, but we all push ourselves way too far. Um, and then there's kind of, I don't know, maybe it's just myself, but I feel like I feel other people feel it, that kind of the self-shoulder responsibility that you just got to keep going no matter what. Um, and it took me kind of having to actually communicate with some of the people I was working with, being like, look, I'm, I'm just not okay today. I actually can't do this today. I can't come run this stage. I can't come be happy, look after these artists. I can't keep my head in the game because I can't barely keep my head on. Um, and then I was really worried about having those conversations with people because you don't want to you don't want to get passed over, particularly if you freelance for the next job car because they're weak or whatever, not doing it. But mo everyone's really understanding in the end. But it's kind of that's ingrained, I think, in in culture, uh, probably a lot in male culture as well. The whole the rubbish man up attitude that I like to think that I was not part of, but evidently maybe kind of impacted me as well. And then also for for females in the music, and particularly in the event industry not wanting to be seen as weak. I kind of work with a few girls, particularly in festivals, who don't want to say that they can't do something because they don't want to be looked down upon just because they've said they can't do something because they automatically think somebody's going to think they're a girl, like just because they're a girl. It's like, it's such a vicious cycle. Um, but we can't get away from it unless we start telling people. I think that 
rounds things up really well. Do you want to add one more thing, Christine? Um, the only thing I was going to say is that on Monday we actually have a big announcement, so I'm going to give you a slight preview, which is that Help Musicians is launching the first, um, the world's first, as we believe, um, mental health service for the industry um, before the end of the year. We've been scoping it for two years. That's why the research is important. We've been listening. We think we know what people want, um, and yeah... It, um, we're launching the study on Monday, and then before the end of the year, there'll be a service for anyone across the UK, and then we're, we're looking to take it globally as well. So. I think we've got time for a few questions, if anybody... Oh, Keen. Uh, hi everyone. Um, sorry Ben, just wanted to say as well, um, I went to the University of Leeds where I was a student and Ben was the first DJ that I saw when I was in Leeds. Uh, it's really cool, so just get that in there now. <laughs> uh, I think summing up the, the really key points from what everyone's discussed is that um, no matter what you do, what role you play in the industry, you are going to encounter uh, stress and anxiety and potentially more longer term mental health issues. Um, <clears throat> the job that I do, uh, I'm quite passionate and interested in uh, how people work and how that causes them stress and how we can design jobs and things. So for me, the four crucial things that we've summed up are um, <clears throat> self-reflection is really key, okay? And um, it's really important that people understand what self-reflection is, what it means, and how it can be useful. And it isn't just about dwelling on the things that I found difficult. Uh, number two, I'd also say that uh, the way that jobs are structured and the, the working hours that people do and the workload that people do, that does need to happen at an industry level and the roles that the different actors play in that employment relationship needs to be you know, looked at really key because uh, overwork and long hours will lead to many things. Um, <clears throat> One other final thing as well was, um, um, for me, on a personal level, and going off what everyone said, perspective is, is really key in all of this. And um, people's perspective on their own lives and what is stressful varies at different situations. And I think what we said is, by talking to other people, it enables you to see your own situation from a different perspective, and that's what enables you to start on that journey to change things. So I just wanted to sum up three things that I think as a society, self-reflection is a really important personal attribute that we all need to work on. Number two, we all need to understand the, uh, the extent of our ability to cope with stressful situations. And number three, if you find yourself employed in a situation where it is stressful, then that needs to be looked at. So I think that's something that we can all take away from the, uh, the, the talk this evening. Just uh, adding on that as well, um, Life in general for everyone, especially being like you know young people now, is well stressful. All right, you know, like the thing is, we're brought up in a society where we're kind of like you know, you want to be married with kids, with a house and a car by the time you're thirty, which is what our parents and our grandparents did. So we've been brought up with kind of that's kind of the goal, and we all know that's pretty hard to do, right? So we're working harder, we're working longer, and we've got these kind of institutionalized expectations of what success is. So it doesn't matter if you're in the music industry or not, okay? But you, you're gonna, stress and depression, anxiety are almost drilled into life now. So I think what you're saying there is correct, all right? It doesn't, and again, I just wanted to make the point that, you know, even if I wasn't an artist or a musician, I would still have the mental conditions that I've got. All right, and again, most people in this room, a lot of people in this room aren't in the music industry and somehow suffer, all right, and they're not in it. So it is something that exists, and I think it's just the stresses of society these days. So yeah, I think that everything that we've said, even from a musical context, you know, it still reigns true, even if you're not a musician. Talk to people, be aware of it, try and seek help, you know? We've got another question here. Mines won't be as long, and it will be a question. So, <laughs> no offense, Sam. Uh, right, so, sorry. Um, so what I just wanted to say was like, obviously like Christine's brought up like stats um, about how like 70% of the music industry suffer. That's like three times more than normal population. Um, but obviously within them studies, studies aren't kind of always accurate because you're only doing it to per 100 people, but there's thousands of artists. But what I wanted to say is like, 
Um, I know many people that say they suffer from anxiety and depression, but they don't actually suffer from it. Um, but is there any sort of way that like you can you can differentiate? Like I, I personally have never suffered from either, but I, I don't genuinely know what what is like seen as a symptom, what's not a symptom. So it's really hard to differentiate. Like, well, do they actually have it, or is it a publicity stunt like you're Adele and 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 whatever else? Like, do you have any key pointers that you can? sort of uh, tell people that because it, it obviously like there isn't a diagnosis that's the thing there isn't so yeah I mean that's it listen it's like it, it's subjected to individual people depending on kind of what you're going through you know sometimes it's hard to say to someone you've not got anxiety you're just jumping on the bandwagon because if they yeah. do have anxiety that's the worst thing you could possibly say to them because then it isolates them you know, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of the thing you're dealing with. I mean, because I, I never really spoke about it, you know, like the last panic attack I had, I was stood on the, trying to get on the bus and I just couldn't, I just couldn't move. I just, like, the, the thought of getting a bus full of people just, it was like a total breakdown. And, you know, so, so it, it, it varies on different, between people, I think. Yeah, and sorry, and I totally get that, but just like as an, as an extra point, but do you sometimes feel like that puts people off? Like, see people that genuinely suffer from these these symptoms and people mm. that genuinely suffer this illness, that don't want to come out because they feel like they're going to get tarred, like they're jumping on the bandwagon, mm. but they're not, they do genuinely suffer from it. Okay, well, I want to go back to the study point first, if that's okay. Yeah. Which is a fair point. However, I just want to point out that this... Wait for it. Um, so this is actually the world's first study, which I think in 2017 for the industry just to be doing this is pretty disgusting. So um, whilst it might only be 2,200 people that sampled and who wanted to sample, it's the first time it's been done. So I think for me, uh, it's a start. Uh, um, and actually, if it wasn't for this, to be honest, you would, at the moment, with our campaign, we're going around to various parts of the industry saying, look, come on board, help us with this, back our campaign. Um, some of the responses are pretty shocking. So if I have this in my hand and say, look at the stats, then it gives me a case for support. So, um, But that is a fair point, and I take what you're saying. No, it's fine. I just thought I should clarify, though. Thing. Um, no, 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 but um, I, to be honest, I wasn't aware of a bandwagon, <laughs> but oh. yeah, I mean, I think sometimes, well, I can speak from my, per I think that I don't often think about other people because I'm so caught up in my own anxiety. Actually, I'm, and actually, I'm, yeah, and I get the bus point. I'm like, I'm, I swear I didn't go anywhere for eight weeks, actually. I don't really know what happened. But, um, yeah, I, I become consumed, and I know others who become consumed, so it, I don't often think about other people. Does that make sense? Um, so my kind of take on this would be uh, if you asked someone, uh, have you got anxiety? If they don't answer, they have anxiety. If they tweet about it constantly, they don't have anxiety. Because the last thing I wanted to do when I was feeling rubbish was tell everyone. Yeah. So that would be my test. Yeah. If they're reluctant to speak about it, they're probably real. Uh, it's probably not bulletproof, but it's probably a good way to play to start. Okay. Yeah, because my, 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 my friends that I know that suffer, they, they, will, they will avoid the issue. They'll change the subject. They'll want to talk about something else, and I have to hammer them. I say, no, we're fucking talking about this today uh so yeah i think if, if someone's quiet uh and i for me just personally uh, i know a lot of people that are similar it, mine's very physical so if i'm ang anxious I'll, I'll scratch i kind of fidget a lot i'll writhe my hands i'll, I'll be quite uh stammery and quite distracted and jumpy like uh sh like a, uh, walking down the road and a shadow could like go from a bus and i'll jump out of my skin like an idiot uh and then the kind of depression side comes from just being really quiet and just not wanting to speak uh, at all about anything. So um, that might be a good place to start if you want. Have you got a few people that you don't trust? That you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, someone just said that, but that's not really what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Right. Your friends won't be watching this, it's cool. I think we've just got one more question, actually. So. Can, I, can I finish my bit on that, though, quickly? Um, just a quick bit. I think cause I, might, I suffer slightly differently to kind of some of the people. I'm very 
up and down, like quite manic, I guess. Um, not diagnosed as manic or anything like that, but <clears throat> I think kind of like trying to decide if someone else has anxiety or not. I think anxiety is part of the human condition, like Ben was saying earlier, it's how you, your brains react to situations. It's when that anxiety is like massively having a massively detrimental effect, effect on your actual life that that's when you need to kind of reach out to those people because somebody might not be anxious for two months and then they might just have like a week of like crippling and that's like like screws them over um, and that's happened like kind of those kind of situations happen to me I'll be like oh I'm fine I'm wicked like life's great and then bang in bed for a week can't do anything about it like I actually like I crashed my car got hit by a lorry like because I wasn't paying attention because I was so anxious and I was driving Are which would I'm fine it wasn't like I'm not looking for a job story but like that's kind of it was at that point that actually made me realize it's like whoa like I've just done like I wasn't paying enough attention when I was driving a car and I just like pulled out in front of a lorry like talk to someone about it offload a little bit and that helps it's like just because somebody's not feeling like it all the time doesn't mean I like, don't feel like it sometimes I, sorry uh, sorry to bring it back to drugs but um, <laughs> um, obviously uh, dance music's got quite um, like a, a cane of culture and there's like, almost a competitiveness about it and uh, I read an interview with Jackmaster last year where he said that he, he needed to take a bit of a step back and people that he thought his, were his friends at gigs were like, come on, let's get some peak, let's get some booze in, and things like this. And um, it's directed to everyone, but maybe more so to you, Ben. When you turn up as a DJ, you know, promoters, it's in their interest. They, they're, they're having a good night. They want to ply you with drugs, ply you with drink. And how, how damaging is that kind of like one-upmanship of machoism, like drug culture for someone? It maybe not is the cause of mental health problems, but when you're trying to escape from these issues and you're being bombarded in those situations... How do you escape that? Oh, it's so difficult. I mean, and, and things are a lot more appealing when they're free. That's my kind of take <laughs> on it. Like, I, yeah. Um, so, I, I, it's difficult. And I think that's a deep-seated kind of cultural issue as well. It's this kind of lad culture. And it's, um, especially talking about, like, the lad kind of side of things. And just, like, uh, that, that applies to everyone. That's not a, sec that's, that's not a particularly sexually uh, term. Um, Gender, not sexual. Um, so it's yeah, it's it's strange, but it, I f I find it's very much uh, British as well. It's strange because you go to Holland, for example, which is one of my favorite countries to DJ, and everyone's just so like kind of you never see anyone, you never see a Dutch person off their face. Um, so it is it's very difficult to um, to say no, and it, but I think as this discussion is more in the public eye, people are gonna be a bit more relatable to it. And so um, so maybe if someone does say no, they're gonna be like, okay, well, fine, fair enough. But no, I, I, you do encounter quite a lot of resistance. Um, I'm not particularly involved in a, in a kind of party scene, but I can see how that how that would be difficult to get out of if you started to feel, you know, when you, you were in that kind of world. Um, but yeah, it, it's a, it is an issue. And I think the, the kind of claim to me or the kind of plea from my side would be to just go out to people and say, look, you might be having a good time, but just focus on you. Don't, like, don't project onto other people. I think that's a massive thing. I've, I've done, even, actually, differently, I, I turned up a fabric, um, and the, one of the artist liaisons, he was really sound, and this is nothing to do with drugs. I was just, I'd only just woken up, and it was four in the morning, I was playing five till seven. So I'd just woken up, I'd had, I had to fly somewhere else just shortly afterwards. So I was sober. And I don't have a happy face. I'm always kind of, mm. and uh, so he was like, "What's wrong?" And I was like, "Nothing's wrong, man. I'm just fucking tired, and, and I need to DJ in a little bit, and I'm I'm, I'm going to have a drink in a little bit, but not going to get drunk." And he and he kept asking me what was wrong. And uh, fair enough, from his point of view, he was like, "Oh, I've got an artist, and he's not happy because they get told to make him happy." Um, so yeah, it's maybe just people just being more aware and recognizing that uh, there might there might be other things going on. You might not need to get absolutely wasted that night. Um, but no, it is certainly, it's certainly an issue, but I, I, I don't really have an answer on how it can be better. <laughs> so, sadly, sorry, but I um, tried. Well, I wish I could say let's leave it on a high, but maybe not. Oh, <laughs> everything's <laughs> great. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> but either way, <laughs> either way, our, our time has come to an end. And I just want to say a massive, massive thank you to our panelists because this has definitely been the most open discussion that we've had. And... It's a real honor that everyone's came and been so honest and so transparent and, and kind of bared their souls. So thank you and thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to Becca for her amazing moderating. It was fabulous. Thank you to Skittle and that's us. <laughs>